If you followed my video on creating the Fluent2 nav component inside of Power Apps, you'll know it's not compatible with component libraries. One of the most common requests I received from that video was to create a version that was compatible with component libraries. So today we're going to walk through how to take the original Fluent2 nav component from my previous video and refactor it into a version that's compatible with component libraries. We'll be using some advanced custom property techniques and we'll do some other housekeeping items. Let's take a look. Channel members have access to download the apps used in the videos as well as the YAML code used in the components that I showcase. You can click the join button below the video if you're interested in supporting the channel. Now the app that's showcased in this video picks up directly where the original video left off. If you haven't seen the original Fluent2 nav video, I suggest you watch that video first before continuing with this one. That video will be linked in the top right corner. If we look at our app, we have our component inserted on the screen. If we head to our components tab, we'll see our original Fluent2 nav component. You can see this component does not have any custom properties and it has the access app scope toggle enabled. And this is what makes the component incompatible with component libraries. If I select the navigation gallery inside of our component, we can see this is pointed to a collection called Fluent Nav Items. And this collection is actually defined in our app on start. This is building the table of items to show in our nav. The first thing we want to do is move those table items away from on start and instead create a custom property that will input those items into the component. We'll go ahead and create a new custom property and we'll call this items. This will be a data input of type table. For the default property of this items custom property, we'll insert a table using the table function. In this table, we want to define the schema of what our component can expect from an external table that will be fed into the component via the custom property. In this case, we'll want to define each of the options that can be displayed in our nav component. So this would be the button, the divider, the category, and the dropdown. Here we have the schema for a button, so we can see it's expecting an item key, a display name, an icon, a screen, a type, parent key, and whether the option is visible or not. One important thing in the schema to define is the screen. And for this screen in our example schema, we set this to app.activeScreen. This is because our component needs to recognize that what will be given to the component will be a screen. We don't need to define a specific screen in this case because that's going to be different depending on the app that we insert this into. But the trick here is that app.activeScreen is not specific to an app. So we can communicate that this field's type will be a screen. Next, we'll insert two more records into our component, one with an item type of divider and one with an item type of category. We'll insert another option very similar to our button record, and this one will be for a dropdown. So the only difference here is that the dropdown won't have a screen and the item type will be dropdown. The last record that we'll insert here is a second example button. This one will be of type button, but the item's parent key will be example dropdown and that directly corresponds to our dropdown right above this. It's good to have the schema defined here so that anyone that uses this component from your library knows what type of records they can insert into the component. Now that we've defined our items input table, we can go and select our gallery in our component. Instead of pointing our gallery to fluent nav items, we can instead point this to the name of our component, dot items. And you can see here that our items change to show the default items that were shown in our custom property. Now the component is no longer relying on the app scope or any tables defined inside of our app in order to display the gallery items. Now this does pose a problem because our gallery is referencing a static table now. So in that case, our dropdown is no longer able to toggle whether the dropdown item is open or closed. If we go into our component and we go into the dropdown container, we can see originally this was patching the fluent nav items collection and toggling the item open field to the opposite value. We're going to use a trick that I showed in a previous video where we actually create the collection from inside of this component. The collection will store whether the item is open or not without affecting the actual input items. We'll go ahead and create a new custom property and we'll call this change state. This will be an event property and we'll add a parameter called item key. This will be a text parameter and we'll keep it required. Now, because this is an event custom property, 
the event is actually taking place in our app and not inside of our component. So we can force our component to create a collection in our app, and that way the collection is intrinsically created by our component rather than relying on the app to create the collection. This is another change that allows this to be compatible with component libraries. In our change state custom property, we'll first insert a collect function. We'll create a collection called col open items, and we'll use the curly brackets to create a record. For the field name, we'll insert item key with both i and k capitalized, and then for the value of this, we'll insert item key with a lowercase i, and this is pointed to the input parameter that we created for this event. We'll close our curly brackets and we'll close our collect function. Again, the collection that this creates, open items, will be stored in the app rather than in our component. Before the collection, we'll insert an if statement. And here we want to check if a value is blank. The value we want to check will be the result of a lookup function. And the lookup in this case will be to our open items collection. For the condition of this lookup, we'll insert item key is equal to our item key parameter. And the value we want to return is item key. Now, if the result of this lookup into our collection of open items is blank, that means the drop down item in our navigation that we've selected is not currently open. So we'll go ahead and run our collect function to add it to the list of open items. If the result is not blank in this case, here we'll use the remove function to remove a record from our collection of open items. The record that we want to remove in this case we'll find using a lookup function. We'll look up into our open items collection, and we'll search for the item key being equal to our item key parameter, and we want to return this record. We'll close our lookup, and then we'll close our remove function, and then we'll close our if statement. Just to recap this, we're checking if the dropdown that was selected by the user exists in our collection of open items. This collection will be how we determine if the dropdown should be open or closed. If the item does not exist, then we'll go ahead and collect it into our collection of open items. If it does exist, then we'll go ahead and remove it, and that will close the dropdown. Now, because our change state custom property is an event property, the collection that it creates, again, is created in the app, and our component can't access that collection. We need to create a new custom property called open items and this will be a data input of type table. Here we can set the default value of open items to our collection of open items. And with this, we're feeding the collection that was created from our component in the app back into our component via the custom property. Now we need to change the logic of our dropdown so that instead of patching our old fluent nav items collection, it instead calls our custom event property. We'll select both the button dropdown and the button dropdown arrow, and we'll remove our old patch function. Instead of our old patch function, we'll reference fluent to nav dot change state. And for the item key parameter, we'll enter this item dot item key. Now another change we're going to make relates to how the selected item is shown in the gallery. If we look at our button container and we go to container selected, this is of course the blue bar that shows up next to our selected item. Here we can see that we're referencing if this item dot item key is equal to var selected button, then the primary color of our app is shown. Otherwise it's transparent. In this case, instead of checking if our item key is equal to our selected button variable, we want to check if this item dot item screen is equal to app.activeScreen. This is much simpler because we don't have to track what screen the user has selected. As long as there's a matching screen in our item list, it will always show the indicator when we're on that screen. We'll copy this condition and then we'll select our navigation button. We'll scroll down to the icon style and here we'll see that we have the same comparison. We'll replace this with our new comparison for the screen and the active screen. In the font weight of our button, we have the same comparison as well, so we'll switch that out. In our sub buttons container, we also have the selected indicator, and we can replace that condition here as well. In the actual sub button, we'll go to the icon style and replace this condition here, as well as the font weight. 
We'll go to our drop-down container and we'll select our selected indicator there. For the color property, currently we're counting the filtered rows in our old Fluent Nav Items collection, where the item parent key of our buttons is equal to this item's item key. And then we're also checking if the item key is equal to var selected button, as well as this item dot item open is false. This would show the indicator if one of the sub buttons of this dropdown was selected and the dropdown was collapsed. And that way you know that one of the sub buttons has been selected. Instead of filtering on our old Fluent Nav items, we'll filter on our new custom property. So we'll insert fluent to nav dot items. We'll keep the comparison of item parent key is equal to this item dot item key, and we'll remove these last two lines of the filter function. Instead of these, we'll first insert this item dot item key is in fluent to nav dot open items. We'll surround this with parenthesis, and we'll insert an exclamation mark at the beginning. We'll insert a comma and then a new line. And here we'll check if app.activeScreen is in the result of filtering our fluent to nav items, where the item parent key is equal to this item dot item key. We'll return the entire item screen column. And this will check if the currently active screen is a screen associated with any of the sub buttons of this dropdown. So again, with this formula, we're checking if this item dot item key is not in our collection of open items. And we're also checking that our active screen matches any of the item screens from our sub buttons. We'll copy this entire filter function and we'll go to our dropdown button. Here, the icon style has the old filter function, so we'll go ahead and replace that with our new one. The font weight also has the old filter function, so we'll update that. In our drop down arrow, the icon style still has our old comparison to var selected button, so we'll replace that again with item screen is equal to app.active screen. And the same goes for our drop down arrows font weight. We'll go to our sub buttons gallery, and instead of our old collection, we'll again replace this with fluent to nav dot items, and that'll remove our old collection reference. Still on the topic of our sub buttons, we'll select our sub buttons container, and we'll go to the visible property. Previously, we checked if this item dot item open was true, but instead we'll check if this item dot item key is in our open items custom property. We'll go to our button container and we'll go to the navigation button. And here we can see we're still setting our var selected button variable, which we no longer need. So we can go ahead and remove that. Now, if you followed all of those steps so far, we should be able to turn off access app scope. And when we do, we can see that we don't get any errors. When you eventually turn off access app scope, you'll need to restart your app as these custom properties won't truly work right until you've restarted the app. We can see the indicators are shown for both of our buttons here. This is because on the component screen, app.activeScreen is always equal to the item screen in the placeholder items property, which is also set to app.activeScreen. But here we can click on the dropdown and we can see that it expands. Since we've restarted our app, we can also go back to our screen. And here we can see that our navigation still works as intended. This will insert the default items property on all of your Fluent2 nav instances. So in that case, you'll need to change the default items property back to your old collection. Again, instead of our component directly consuming the collection from our app, we're feeding the component the collection via the input items property. This way, the component isn't dependent on a specific app. My recommendation as well would be to move your list of items away from a collection on start into a named formula. So in this case, we can copy all of the records from our old collection, go to formulas, and we can create a new formula. We'll call this NF Fluent Nav Items. And we'll set this as a table of all of our old navigation items. Now we have no need for this collection and we can replace it with NF Fluent Nav Items. We can do this on all of our screens. And now you can see our app is working as expected and our component is compatible with a component library. One other thing we forgot to do is change our dropdown arrow based on the dropdown being open. So we'll go to our dropdown arrow button and we'll select the icon. 
Here, this is checking if the old item open property is true, but in this case, we'll switch this to this item dot item key is in fluent to nav dot open items. And if we play our app, we can see our app is working as expected. One other quick fix we'll put into place is to fix the sliding animation that happens when you move to a different screen. When a dropdown is expanded, there's a sort of sliding animation there, as well as when I go to a different screen with that dropdown open. Now this sliding animation happens because the auto height gallery needs a moment to determine what the new height of that item should be in the gallery. We can fix this by predetermining the height. We'll go to our main container and we'll go to the height property. Here you can see the original formula was just taking the height of container height dot y. If you no longer want the sliding animation, you can replace this with a switch statement on this item dot item type. If it's a category, then we want the height to be 32. If it's a divider, then we want the height to be eight. If it's a dropdown, we want to check if this item dot item key is in fluent to nav dot open items. And if it is, we want the height to be 40 plus container sub buttons dot height. If the item is not open, then we want the height to be 40. And lastly, if none of those conditions are met, then we'll set the default height as 40. With this fix in place, the predetermined heights prevent the sliding animation from happening. That switch statement is calculated quicker than the gallery can calculate the new height of the item. With all of our changes made now, we can go ahead and bring our component into a component library. We'll right click our component and we'll select view code and then we'll click on the button to copy the code. In our library, we can insert a new component and then right click and paste. We can see our fluent to nav is brought into our component library with no issues. We'll go ahead and save this, and then we'll open up a fresh app. Here we can insert and get more components, and then inside of our library, we can see our fluent to nav. We'll select that, and we'll import it into our app. We can insert this on the screen, and from here we could build our new named formula and insert that formula into the items property of the table. And that's about it. I hope you found this video helpful in updating your Fluent2 nav to be compatible with component libraries. This idea of creating collections from the component rather than from the app is so useful in making components usable across many different apps. The fact that you can feed these collections back into the component keeps them in sync with other instances of the component in your app. For instance, since we've created a collection for open items, the open items on one screen are the same as the open items on the other screen, because both instances of the component are being fed the same collection that was created from the component itself. So all copies of the component receive that same collection. It can be hard to grasp at first, but once you see it in practice, it really starts to make sense and it unlocks the power behind some of these new component properties. If you have any questions about making these updates, feel free to leave those in the comments below. If you're a premium channel member and you've downloaded the original version of the Fluent2 nav component, you'll see a link in the description of this video to download the new version of this component. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video and have a great day.